Um, all right, so um, as, as we get into looking at the second ordinance, uh, last week we looked at communion. This week we're looking at baptism. Why do we do this in the church? What's the importance of baptism? Um, I wanted us to look in Romans chapter 6 because I think Paul gives us a really unique view of this. He's not actually talking about water but he's talking about what water baptism actually reveals. Why do we actually do it? And what is it imaging? What is it picturing? Uh, so I think it just gives us this beautiful picture of this. And I want us to read this together. So Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. And you're going to notice uh, that Paul repeats himself a lot, especially in the book of Romans. He works in the rule of nines, and he just kind of thinks to himself like, I know you didn't just get what I just said, so I'm going to say it again. And then I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. He says it four times in four different ways that are very similar in these verses that we're about to read. So what we'll do is try to pull all of those things together. Uh, so it might not look like a typical, here's what he's saying in verse 2 and verse 4 this morning, but we're going to kind of bring it all together, uh, what Paul is actually saying. And he does give us some little nuances in each of the four different little sections. But you'll see what I mean as we read this. Um, chapter 6 of the book of Romans, starting in verse 1. Here's God's word. What shall we say then? And he's really pulling off of what he had just said, and you can kind of get a, a, a summary of that if you just look back at chapter 5, starting in verse 12 through 21. That'll give you a good summary. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Now, he's going to say it again. We probably didn't get that, right, Paul? Here we go. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in resurrection like his. We know that our old self has cru was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we are died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ raised from the dead will never die. We will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, but to make you obey the passions. Do not present your members of sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. God, your truth is so beautiful, and I ask this morning that we would understand it in a deep way, in a new way, that it would, it would capture our hearts and our souls, that in this moment our hearts would be completely yours, that by your grace your spirit would fill every single one of us, that you would teach us to love you in a deeper way through your word and your truth this morning, that you would bring us into a fullness of peace and, and grace and your glory as we study your word, and God, that we would be a people who give 100% of ourselves to you. And so, God, I just I, I ask this morning for anybody that might not know you that today might be the day of their salvation. And for those of us that do, we might walk in you in a deeper way as we look at what baptism reveals, that it would be a reminder, a testimony, a witness to us of what you have done in our hearts, and it would transform the way that we live. God, we lift up every church in our city and around our world that, that is proclaiming your gospel truth this morning. We pray blessing and favor and grace and mercy upon them. God, I just uh, think of a few churches in our area that I just want to lift up to you, God. I pray for Tapestry Church, for Revo Church, for Two Cities Church, for, uh, for Redeemer, God. I pray for uh, King Street Church. I pray for Salem Chapel. God, I, just, I, I wish that I could think of more names that just came to mind, God, but we just lift up your church of this city. And God, we pray that you would do a mighty work in it today. God, bless us as we look at your word and help us to understand you in a true and deeper way this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, how many of you like reality TV shows? It's okay to raise your hand. Uh, it's okay if you do. Now, when I ask you if you like reality TV shows, uh, I'm not asking you if you like the weird stuff, all right? There's a, bu there's a bunch of weird stuff out there. Uh, just if you've ever watched the TLC channel, you know. 
Um, and TLC is like, to my knowledge, the only channel that's dedicated to learning. And it is like useless information, most of it, right? Like some of the shows on there, I heard of a show this week, and this is actually what made me think of this. Um, but I heard of a show this week. I was like, there's no way that show exists. So I had to Google it to make sure. But if you've ever watched TLC, you know that there are hundreds of shows out there that should not be shows, right? And it's reality TV. There are shows on there. There's one called, okay? And, and a few people in the first service had actually seen this. Dr. Pimple Popper. Have you guys, you guys like this show? Okay, like this, this is nuts to me. Um, but there's the show called Dr. Pimple Popper. There's Toddlers and Tiaras, which is just AKA Mom's Second Chance, right? Like, I don't know, I don't know why that needs a show. There's the Extreme Couponing. Uh, there's lots of shows about that, which I guess in and of itself, that's pretty educational. We, we should all be frugal. My Five Wives, all right? Like, <laughs> okay, I don't need to see that. Like, I got enough trouble at my house, <laughs> right? Shows on hoarding, there's just tons of shows on hoarding. There's, there's hundreds, I feel like there's a hundred shows on cake, right? I mean, you just put a name in front of cake and you can have a TV show. Um, and I guess we, if you're a baker, that one's good for you too. My personal favorite though, this is the one that I heard of that I had to kind of double check and, and, and just what is TLC doing? Here's what it's called. My Strange Addiction. Have any of you guys seen this one? This is, this is crazy. Like, God bless this girl. The, the first thing that popped up, and I'm glad she's trying to get help, um, was that there was this girl who's addicted to eating her furniture, right? And so her, her roommates will leave, and she'll unzip the couch cushion and just start snacking, right? And this is her addiction. Um, and, and so a couple of things that I just want to point out. One, if you are really, really struggling with something that is really, really weird, there is hope in Jesus. Let me just point that out. But secondly, there's also a lot of money to be made through TLC. So if you got something crazy going on, just give them a call. You can have a show. Um, but, but the second thing that I want to point out here is that I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. When I talk about reality TV shows and us liking those types of shows, I'm talking about something a little bit more popular, something that we can all kind of relate to, shows like uh, flipping a house or something of that nature. Maybe we don't like reality TV. Maybe we don't watch it that much, but all of us... Could, could probably come to a, a consensus that we would love for somebody to come in and make our home just absolutely our dream home. Um, so we like watching shows where there's this house that I would never buy that. I would never move into that. But then somebody comes in and they totally renovate it and it just looks beautiful. And you're like, I would do anything to live in that home, right? There's a transformation that occurs. Uh, a show like The Voice where somebody gets to show off their talents and then a coach turns around and says, hey, I'm going to make your dreams come true. I'm going to help you with this. There's a transformation that happens that all of us can kind of relate to, uh, right? We have shows um, that, that have different kinds of things like Love Life, and I, and I wouldn't recommend The Bachelor to you, but I know a lot of you watch The Bachelor. The idea of it has this transformation that we want, that we would fall in love and find the one, and, and we would be there. Shows like The Biggest Loser, all kinds of shows where we see transformation in life that all of us can kind of desire. Uh, one of my favorite shows when I was in college, it had four glorious years of running while I was in college, and then they, they came to their senses, but it was called Pimp My Ride. Um, and I would get out of class, and I would go home, and I would kind of eat lunch, and that was just on. And so, like, I would watch it, and, uh, and it was just this, car where they, this show where they would take these old cars, and they would just make them amazing, right? And I was really into cars at the time. But all of us have different things where we, we kind of relate to these transformational stories. We desire transformation in our lives. Every single one of us desires to be transformed, to have some sort of newness coming, that we want to we believe that we're on this pathway to something better, that there is transformation that's possible for us, and every single one of us are working towards it. It's a story that every single one of us wants. We want something to come into our lives and fix our house, our car, our life, our love life, whatever it may be, right? All of the things that we feel like are holding us back in life, we want to be transformed. We want to be made new. And there's a reason for that. It's, it's one of the reasons, though, that, that we even tear up when we see life transformation. We might not know anything about the person we might have zero interest in what's happening in their life and how they're transforming, but suddenly we get this story, this testimony, this witness of transformation, and it just brings uh, tears to our eyes for some reason. 
And the reason is because we all desire, we relate to those types of things. We desire transformation in our own lives. We desire that ultimately because we were created for it. Every single one of us was created to have something that we innately don't have in and of ourselves. We walk away from what we were created to have in our sin and brokenness, that God created us to be in community with him, to have everything that we long for in him, that by giving him glory and being in that community and realizing that he is the one true God, that he is the one that we look to, that he is the one that we live for, that it's about his will and his kingdom, not our will and our kingdom. We were created to glorify him and find joy in that glorification. And when sin and and brokenness separate us from the pure and perfect and holy God, we don't have that community with him anymore, then all of a sudden we are all on this path of desiring to regain what we lost. We all want transformation. We all want to be made new. We relate to these things because it's our story. We want our brokenness to be redeemed. And though the theme of Scripture is all about God, God tells us the story in Scripture of how He comes as only He can come. And He lives perfectly on our behalf, and He dies to pay the penalty of our sin, and He rises to overcome sin and death so that in Him we might die to sin, that we might rise and have new life, that we might be transformed, that we might have a new identity. That is what baptism reveals and represents. It's a testimony to that. Baptism doesn't save us, but it shows what's happened to us on the inside because Christ came and lived and died and rose. And by his grace, we can be saved by putting our faith in the reality that he has done all of the work for us to have salvation in him and in him alone. We're brought back into that community where we have what we were created to have in him. We begin to live in freedom and the identity that he has given us by his work. We're not enslaved to the things of the world anymore. I don't have to go find my hope. I don't have to find my identity. I don't have to find my meaning. God gives it all to me, and he's already accomplished everything that I need for me to rest in it. So my life is completely transformed. It is made new. It is completely redeemed. I'm in this process of being able to live in that truth and that reality in this life. But in Christ, I am made new. That's what baptism represents, that we're transformed by his grace. And that's the story that scripture tells. So this book, this Bible, is the ultimate reality story of transformation that every single one of us longs for. The reason that we relate to anything other, any other kind of transformation is that we desire what scripture tells us that we can have in God alone. And so this is our transformation story. This is all about God and his glory. And that's why we love baptism here at Redemption Hill Church. Because it reveals the gospel truth. It's an image of something that is so beautiful. That's why we're absolutely about Jesus. Because baptism is absolutely about Jesus. Jesus transforms and changes everything. And he is our only hope. He is the only one that we desire for. He's the only one that we were created for. He changes everything. He gives us an identity. He makes us new. He transforms our hearts. He allows us to live in the freedom that he has purchased for us by living in his will and for his kingdom. There's nothing more beautiful than that. And that's what baptism represents. That's what we're going to see this morning. And that's why we absolutely love baptism here because of what it represents. It represents three things. For the one who's being baptized, it is a witness. It it is a reminder. It is an explanation that I am new in Christ, that I have died to my sinful self and enslavement to sin, from seeking my own life and to seeking my own hope and to seeking my own meaning. And I am given life, given meaning, given hope, given identity in Christ. So when we go down underwater, we are saying, I am dead to those things. Those things no longer rule over me. I'm no longer enslaved to them. And because Jesus rose, we rise. And when we come out of the water, we have new life. It represents that new life that we have in our hearts when we give our life to Christ. It's a picture of giving our life to Christ and salvation in him. So when we come out of the water, it's a picture of new identity, new life, new joys, new desires, new wills, new loves, new actions, new identity. Everything is new. We've been transformed. So it reveals that of our own lives, but then it's also a testimony to the church body. That's why we do it before the church. It only happens one time after you give your life to Christ because you are, once you are his and once you are in him, you are in him and you are his for all of eternity. 
We participate in communion here every single week because it's a remembrance of what Christ has done for us. But baptism is a picture of what he did in our own hearts. That's why we do it once. We do it before the body. This is the second thing because it reminds us as fellow believers of what has happened in our own souls. What God has done in our lives. It's a reminder that I have been made new. That we are new together. That we are a new people. That we are his church. That we are his kingdom. It, it encourages the body. And thirdly, it bears witness to the rest of the world that doesn't know Christ, that there is a transformation that they long for and desire. It is the image, it is the ultimate reality show, if you will, of revealing that there is new life, that there is transformation, and it all comes in Christ, and it happens in your soul, and then you bear image to it through baptism by burying in the water and rising into new life and new identity in Him. That's why we love it here. That's why we absolutely, we cheer, we stand up, we don't let you golf clap when somebody comes to faith and then follows in believer's baptism because they are saying to the world, I identify with Christ. I have new identity in him. I am made new. I am transformed. Everything that I long for, I have found in him. The transformation that, I, that I've looked for and searched for, I have found. That's why we love it. That's why when we planted this church a little over two years ago, two years ago in two months, we planted this church to see lostness decrease in our city, not just to gather a whole bunch of people as many as we could around an event. Because listen to me, this is, this is a mission, not a show. And some of you will get that if you, if you pay attention to pop culture. If you don't, get out a little bit more, <laughs> right? Listen to some Kanye West. Uh, and so, so this is a mission, not a show, all right? And so we, we set out to see lostness decrease in our city, not just gather around an event. We wanted to send out missionaries. So as you go, where you live and where you work and where we play, we are calling you to live intentionally, just as we live intentionally as leaders of the church, that we might see people come to faith and grow and be sent out and follow in believers' baptism and, and that we would be disciples who make disciples, and so by God's grace, over these last two years, we've seen 95 people be baptized. It's been incredible, but we, by God's grace, want to see more and more as you invite more and more of your friends, as you go out where you live, work, and play, and live missionally. And we believe in the priesthood of all, all believers that all of us are called to the ministry, wherever it is that you live, work, and play. And so you might have noticed that when we do baptisms here, we allow people who may have played a role that God had used in their life to participate in their baptism. And one of my prayers for you this year is that every single one of you will participate in the, that God would use you to participate in the salvation and baptism of one of your friends that doesn't yet know Jesus. That more and more names might go up on that wall for prayer for salvation and more and more names might come off of that wall because they're saved. That's my prayer for us. That's what we're about here. So when you come to Redemption Hill Church, guess what? It, 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 we are going to talk about Jesus it's going to be all about Jesus. That's why we love baptism, because baptism is all about Jesus. That's what we're going to see through Romans this morning. So baptism is something that is so beautiful, and we want to see God move in powerful ways. But here's the thing. I know a lot of people, they don't necessarily understand what baptism really is. Maybe you've even grown up in the church, and you're just kind of like, I don't know. It was just something that we did. You know, like it, it happened at the very beginning of the service, so I would go in late, or it happened at the end of the service, so I would leave early, right? And it was just something where after I prayed the prayer and after I came forward, the pastor said, this is the next thing for me to do. So I just did it. Or, or maybe we have a, a, a two-sentence explanation of what baptism is, because that's what we've always grown up kind of hearing. Or maybe you've grown up in a different denomination, and so baptism was something different. And we're not going to talk about all those things this morning. We're simply going to look at what Paul says baptism represents, um, but, but this is how we believe that it is represented. And in the first several hundred years of church history, there's no evidence that it wasn't done in this way. And so when we see what Paul has to say this morning, I think we'll, we'll see that the reason that we do baptism the way that we do baptism. But then some of us, we didn't grow up in church at all. And, and baptism kind of looks like the Kool-Aid of the church, right? It's just kind of like, is that the, the, this is a cult, right? As soon as the baptismal tub comes out, you're like, why would I do that? Um, and so a lot of us don't really understand what's going on, that when we receive Christ, we are visually representing that, and it bears witness in those three ways that we just talked about. And so I know some of us struggle with that, and Paul here tells us exactly what baptism reveals. And so as we look in these verses, he kind of couples some of the verses together, verses 1 through 4, 5 and 6, and then 7 through 11. 
There's some different little nuances there that we'll kind of see. And then in verses 12 through 14, uh, there's a little bit of a shift in what he says, but it's very similar to the other three instances. And so we'll try to wrap all of this together. Here's how he starts out. Look in verse 1 again. He starts out by saying, and I think this is something that we really need to understand if we're going to understand baptism. It may not look like we're getting there, but we will. When we are set free from sin and self, when we have placed our faith in Christ, when we have been brought back into community with God by his work for us on our behalf, by his grace, by placing our faith in him, all that he talks about in the verses and chapters leading up to this, then he says with this question, what shall we say then? And he's asking this question in regard to how do we live our lives? How do we live our lives in reflection of what Christ has done? If we are made new in him, we have a new identity in him, we, we have the transformation that we long for, new life in the reality that Christ has done everything on our behalf for us to have salvation and for us to live out that salvation. And in verse 9, he says, for us to have a future glory with him for all of eternity in, in the resurrection, when, when we are once and for all with him, if we are to have all of those realities true of us, then what does that mean for us when we live out our daily lives? That's, what, that's the reflection in which he's asking this question. How does who we are affect all that we do? How does our identity determine our activity? That's what he's asking. Are we to receive salvation and live as though we have not been transformed? It seems really silly when we ask the question in that way. Do you receive salvation? Do you get the new home and then ask for the old one back? Right? Does your, does your ride get pimped out? And then you want the jalopy back, right? Like, is that, is that how this works? Do, do you receive the transformation that you long for? Are you given the new identity that you desire? And then you just keep on going and living as though you were never transformed. As though you were never given new life. As though your identity is still exactly the same. That's what he means when he asks, are we to continue to sin that grace may just abound? Do we just act like we're not transformed at all? That we're not different at all? That because God showed grace to us and he gets glory through showing grace to us, that we should just sin all the more so that he is more and more gracious and that he get, receives more and more glory from that? Is that how we are to live? And, and listen, I, I know that there's this weird tension for us as, as believers, and it's been a tension in the church for a very long time, this tension between grace and works. And what does this look like? And how do we kind of reconcile these two things? Is this, the chicken come before the egg, right? Do we have to work and, and we're good and therefore we have this salvation opportunity? Or do we just get this salvation opportunity and then we are a good person? We start changing and transforming. And, and, and if we're saved by grace and, 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 and we're saved by nothing that has to do with any of our works or anything that we have done or anything that we will do and God can't love us anymore and he can't love us any less, it's all about his work and us placing our faith in that, then why does it matter if we do good works? Because it's all about his grace. And so we can have this circular argument over and over and over again. And we do in the church all the time. And it makes sense, right? Because the idea is, if I'm saved by grace, then why do I have to do good things? And if I have to work for it, then how is it even grace? And, and, and what does it even all mean? And so why do I have to worry at all about living differently? Why do I have to worry about God's will and salvation and not mine? Why is he not for me? And why do I have to be for him? Why is it about his kingdom and not my kingdom? Why does he determine the way that I walk in freedom? It seems to me like freedom is just the ability for me to say, God, thank you so much for dying on the cross for my sin, and I will receive that and make that a part of my life. And then I just get to go on living however I want to, and I've got to get out a free uh, card from hell, right? Like I just, I, I, got, I said the prayer, I walked forward, I got baptized, and now I can just do whatever I want to. And, and thank you for the freedom of salvation, and I will participate in that freedom by living however I desire. It seems like that's what freedom actually is. But what Paul is saying is when we just live out the way that we desire naturally, it's actually enslavement. It's not freedom. That we're living in a way where we're trying to achieve, if we're a Christian, we're trying to achieve in things of the world by our own desires what God has already given to us. So, so we're not living in what's been given to us by Christ, the identity that we have in him, but we're, we're saying, I'll take that identity just for salvation in heaven, but I'll live however I want to, and I'm still going to work in the things of the world for the things that I feel like I actually desire. And Paul says, we're actually enslaved to those things because I have to work really hard for them to get what I think I need out of them. 
And freedom actually comes in Christ, and it's the freedom that he has purchased for us to walk in the ways that he has actually designed for us to walk. And when we have our identity in him, we're actually living out the way that we live from an identity, whereas in everything else in the world, we're living for an identity. So all the work we do, we're doing for something, but in Christ, all the work we do, we're doing from something. There's a transformation that happens in our lives, and therefore it begins to change the way that we think and the way that we live. So this is the thing that that Paul is pointing out for us here in Romans. Now, most Christians would not ever say that, you know what, I just kind of, I'm adding Jesus to my life. I'm just going to add him to my life. I want the freedom of salvation. God, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your salvation. I'm glad that I get to go to heaven when I die, but now I'm going to live the way that I want to live. Most of us wouldn't say that. Most of us don't believe that scripture allows for that. Like we know, Jesus never says anywhere in Scripture, I really just want you to somehow, in a simple way, identify yourself with me. Just say a prayer, get dunked in some water, kind of attend a church, and you're good. You can then just go and do you, right? God never says that in Scripture. He never says that you're not called to glorify me, that you're not called to live for me, that you're not called to love like me, that, that you're just simply called to identify in some way with me. But I think we do that a lot. We see God like a Facebook friend. It's like, okay, I'm going to friend you. I'm not going to block you. Every now and then I'll, I'll like some things that, are, that have to do with you, and I'll post a couple of Bible verses every now and then, right? And that's kind of the way we live out our Christian faith. And I know most Christians wouldn't say that, but that's what a lot of Christians do. That's why many unbelievers don't see any value in Christianity. They don't see anything that's genuine. They don't see true transformation. That's why they're more interested in transformations that they see in the world, because they don't actually see the transformation that the gospel brings. So we can't just add Jesus to our lives and expect for transformation to be there that we actually ultimately long for. And Paul helps us with this. He says, this is how we should live in Christ, right? And so when he asks the question, should we just keep on going and sending all the more that grace may abound? He says, by no means, right? Because we're not saved to continue living as though we had not been made new. We are transformed in Christ. We have everything that we were created to have in him. Therefore, we begin to live differently because of who we are. See, and who we are will always determine what we do. We also, though, indirectly here, don't see that the law is something that we use as a means for salvation. So the law doesn't save us at all. It's not our work, but it's Christ's work. So here's what Paul does. He brilliantly... He does not put any kind of tension between grace and works at all. We do that, but God doesn't do that. Here's what Paul does. He poses this question to reveal that there is no tension here at all between grace and works when it comes to salvation. See, we put that on there because most of our lives in in a sinful world, we live in this two-way street. So if I do this, then I deserve this. If I don't do this, then I don't deserve this, right? And, And this is kind of the way we work. If I work really hard, I should get the raise. Uh, If I do really good in school, I should get the A. And so we kind of work in this two-way street. If I do this, I get that. Salvation is not that way. When When we're actually seeking the identity that we want and long for, because we were created to have it in God and in God alone, then what we actually long for and are searching for in the transformation and new life that we want, it doesn't work that way. It's not a two-way street. It's a one-way street. It's that God has done all of the work for us, and we are able to rest in all the work that he has done. And so we begin to live out the identity that he has purchased for us. And so here's here's how this works when we're looking for salvation in anything. It's not a two-way street. Every single one of us worships something that we think will give us the life that we want, the transformation we're looking for. All of us do. We don't call it worship, but all of us worship. We're constantly worshiping, worshiping something, whether it's a religion, a philosophy, something in the world, our own hearts. Christ, whatever it is, we are always all worshiping all the time. And whatever we worship will determine what we work for. All of us are working all of the time. All of us are moving towards something all of the time. Whatever you worship, you will work towards, whether it is God or it is the rest of the world. But here's the reality we've already pointed out. When you find your identity in Christ, all of the work has already been done. So you get to work from an identity that's purchased for you and given to you by grace, but everything else you have to work for to try to gain. 
So you're worshiping something in hopes that it will produce what you want. And you're working really hard in hopes that you will get it. But in Christ, he is the only one that allows you to work from hope, from the reality of life, the fact that you have everything that you were created to have. And this is what Paul is pointing out here, that, that we all worship and we all work. There's no, there's no tension between God's grace and work, but when we are in God's grace, we work from what God has done for us and what he is doing in us. We don't work for something like we do when we worship something in the rest of the world. But all of us worship and all of us are working. The cool thing that happens, though, in the gospel truth is I'm no longer working out of a, a desire to get something that I would already have, but I'm working out of a realization of what I already have. So what I'm doing when I place my faith in Christ is I begin to work in a way that produces a love for what I am doing to glorify and honor God because I was created to do so, and in community with him I can, and out of glorifying him I get joy. I get the joy I was created to have. It's the life that I was designed to have. It's the transformation that I long for. And, and so we, we say this often here, but when we, when we place our faith in Christ and we get that identity, then the things that we begin to do for God and for his glory and out of his will and for his kingdom, we do out of love. It's like when you fall in love with somebody, this, this is how we, we usually kind of give this analogy on. When you fall in love with somebody, you're not thinking about all of the things that you used to do that you stopped doing. Right? Like you're just in love and you just want to do anything that you need to do to reveal that love. And, and, and you used to make fun of people that would fall in love with somebody and then do all of the things that they didn't used to do and that they used to make fun of too. But then when you fall in love with somebody, you're like, this makes total sense. Right? Like why was I doing any of those things? Why was I not doing this before? And I remember when I first really understood the gospel truth and, I, and God really began to dig into my life and transform my heart. I started doing all of these things I never would have done before, and I didn't even want to do them while I was doing them. Like, all of my friends would be going out and doing the things that we used to do before I got really serious about Christ, and then I would be like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm just going to stay in my dorm room and read my Bible. And then I was like, why did I just say that? Right? Like, why do I want to do that? That is such a weird desire. Why is that what I want to do? And then they started doing all these things that I saw that weren't good for them. And then I started trying to speak truth into their lives. And I saw the way that they were responding. And I was like, why am I trying to speak truth into their lives? I don't want to do that. I don't want this confrontation. Right? And then I started seeing some of them come to faith. And then some of them didn't at all. And they didn't like anything that I was doing. And, and, but all of this, these things were happening in my heart. And I wanted to do all of them. Because it was out of an identity that Christ had given to me. It wasn't out of something that I was trying to gain. See, if I was trying to gain identity from speaking truth into my friends, every time they said no, I would have been like, well, that's not getting me the identity I want. So I'm not going to do that anymore. Or I would work even harder to do something to gain some kind of identity that I want. See, I'm, uh, in Christ, I'm working from an identity of joy. And the more I do and live in that identity, the more I glorify him and the more joy and happiness that I find in my own life. But in anything else, I'm actually being enslaved to the thing that I'm trying to find joy in, and I'm going to have to work really hard to try to produce what only God can give me. That's what Paul's pointing out. There's no tension between grace and work. We all worship and we all work. The reality is, is what we are worshiping uh, giving us an identity that we can work from, which only Christ can do, or is what we are worshiping trying to, we're trying to gain an identity from, which will never give us the identity that we want. That's the radical difference between the gospel and everything else. That in Christ, this is what we have in him. And this radical transformation is what baptism represents. It's a picture of that. So we are given this identity in Christ that leads us to a new life, a new identity, a new work. Because Paul says, in him you are a new person. Where all the work has been done for you and all the work has been done by him. So therefore, when you come to him, you have a new love, you have new life, you have new desires, you have new wills, you, you desire to reveal him and live for him and love that. This is why we say all of the time at Redemption Hill Church that the hard work of Christianity is not working hard to gain what you don't already have in Christ, but to focus less on your work and more on the completed work of Christ in you. And when you do that, you will perform better. Because you will love what God is doing in you, and you will love to honor him, and you will find joy in that and that alone. 
That's why Paul says here in the text, don't you know? Like he's talking to these believers. He's saying, don't you understand the identity? And, and I see it kind of in, this, in this, this way of just almost begging for us to remember. Don't you know that in God you have new life? You're not enslaved to the things of the world anymore. You've been given everything that you long for. The transformation is there. Live in it. And he, and he goes, how do we know that the transformation is there? Here's what he says. Here it is. You have been baptized in Christ. And he's not talking about water there. He's saying that when we give our lives to Christ, we are submerged. We are, we are one with. We are made new in. We are baptized, engulfed in Christ. We become one with him. That everything that is true of him, we are in him. I love this because if you were standing on, on a boat dock in Jesus' day and you started yelling out the word here in Greek baptismo, like what you would be saying is, as you were yelling that out and pointing to your boat is, uh, my boat is underwater. Like everything in it is underwater. Every room, every nook, every cranny, everything in it, it is completely soaked. It is submerged. It is one in the There's nothing that the water isn't touching. Like, nobody would yell out baptismo and start freaking out on the, on the dock of the boat because somebody sprinkled a little water on the helm. Like, they're saying it is completely under. Like, we have new identity in Christ, and we can live the transformed life because when we give our lives to Christ, we are completely one with him. We're submerged in him. He covers us. Our sin is covered. He gives us new life. Our identity is his identity. Our, his righteousness is our righteousness. His hope is our hope. When God sees us, he will say one day when we stand before him, well done, my good and faithful servant, not because of what you do, but because when he sees you, he sees Christ because you're baptized in him. There's not a nook and cranny of your life that God does not control when you are in Christ that isn't his and is not covered by his blood and his, his, his death and his resurrection. You are all in him. That's why when we come out of the water, when we go under the water, we are dying to ourselves. And when we come out of the water, we have new life in him because you are one with him. You're immersed in in unity with him. This is what Paul's saying. This is what he's, he's saying baptism actually reflects, and I love that he uses the word baptismo here to reflect who we are in Christ when he's not even talking about baptism by water. He's just saying this is what baptism by water reveals. See, baptism is not just a command to get wet and go on with your life. It's a picture. It's a testimony. It's a reflection of what Christ has done in us. Don't you remember, Paul says, that you are one in Christ, that you are in him, you no longer have to live in the things of the world. You're no longer enslaved to the things of the world. You no longer have to go and find yourself in the world. You no longer have to worry about or search for identity. You come out of that water, and it represents the fact that when you placed your life in Christ, you have a new identity. You have new loves and new desires and new wills and new definitions for success, a new mission, a new joy. You have been transformed in the way that you have always longed to be transformed. When you place your faith in Christ, you are a new person. No matter what you have done, no matter where you have been, you are forgiven. His blood has covered you. You have died to that sin. You are no longer enslaved to it. You rise because he rose, and you have new life. You're pure. You're holy. You're righteous. Your job now is to learn to live in that. Not to become something that you, that you aren't already in him. This is what baptism reveals. This is why we love it so much. This is even what Jesus shows in his baptism. Guys, this is so, this is so incredible. You can see an example of this in Mark 1, uh, starting in verse 9. It's one of the more succinct versions of Jesus' baptism. But when Jesus um, begins his earthly ministry, we know he was doing things before, but the ministry that we read about in Scripture in the four gospel accounts, when Jesus begins, he actually goes to John the Baptist. And John was baptizing people as a, as a revealing of the need for repentance, that a Messiah would come. And Jesus comes to him and says, hey, I want you to baptize me. Like, we would expect Jesus to show up where John's baptizing and be like, all right, bro, my turn. Like, you can, you can be relieved of your duties. I'm going to baptize now. But Jesus gets in the water and he wants John to baptize him. 
We always ask the question, why? And generally, we just come up with the answer, oh, well, God, Jesus was glorifying the Father, and he was revealing to us a picture and being an example of what we need to do. And both of those things are true. He was doing that, definitely. But there's something so much richer happening here. There's a picture that's so much deeper that is revealed in the reason that we actually participate in baptism today. So what was Jesus actually doing? And as quickly as we can, we can walk through this, you can look back at the text yourself, but when Jesus comes out of the water, he goes under the water, comes out of the water, what does scripture say? Do you remember that the sky is torn open, that God speaks, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, that the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove revealing life. You know the only other place that the, the Trinitarian God shows up like this in all three persons at the same time in this way? Since Genesis 1 through 3. The creation. You know the only other place that the, the word is used torn in two, the sky torn in two, is when Jesus is hanging on a cross and he says, it is finished and the veil in the temple is torn in two, representing the reality that we can now have community with God through the blood of Christ and his death and his resurrection. We can have that new life, that we can be made one with him. You know what's happening when Jesus is baptized? Yes, he's saying this is an example. Yes, he's saying this glorifies the Father, but he's also saying this is a new creation. This is a new covenant that I have come to do something new, to recreate, that sin can be dead and buried and new life can come through what I am going to do. And he represents what he's going to do through his baptism, that I will die and I will rise. And that through my death and resurrection, you can have new life. This is what he came to do, to bring the new covenant and we see this in baptism, and this is why we participate in it. It is not just to walk in obedience to God. It's not just to glorify him. It is an actual picture of new creation, new life, new identity in him. That when we place our faith in him, this beautiful picture can occur. And it is a testimony to the church. And it is a witness to the rest of the world that Jesus came and that Jesus died and that Jesus rose. And that in him we can have new life and we can be transformed in the way that we long to be. And in verse 9, he says, surely if we have risen with him, we are no longer enslaved to sin. And surely if we have risen with him, we will rise with him again when he returns. That not only do we live in victory now, but we will live in a victory for all of eternity. That everything will one day be made new. That is the wonderful display of baptism. That's what it reflects. That our hearts and our identity have been made new in Christ. So in verse 11, when he says, so stop living in the way that you used to live. Don't let sin overrun you. Don't let small things become big things. Listen to me. Sin is seeking to kill you. I don't care how small it is. John Owen said, sin will either be killing you or you will be killing sin. And however small it is or however big it is, it is seeking to destroy you. And Paul says, when we are in Christ and we are new in him, we're not going to be perfect. Yeah, we're going to struggle with the flesh and things are going to happen in our lives. But, but, the, but we do not have to be enslaved to those things and we don't have to seek life in those things anymore. They're dead to us. We can reject them. We can refuse them. So listen, the question is that in this life, are we ever going to sin? We will in this life. But here's the question. If your identity is in Christ, do you sin for life or do you repent of sin for life? That's a question that we have to ask. Is my identity in him? Are you fighting sin? Are you fighting against the spirit to overcome the desire and action of sin? Or are you fighting against the spirit to find life in that sin? These are the realities that we can begin to fight with when we have an identity in Christ. So Paul says, fight sin. Don't just fall into it. Don't let it build up into your life until it becomes an idol. That's what he says in verse 12. He uses the word epithemia, this, this growing desire that suddenly becomes an idol in our life, and it's the thing that we seek life in. He says, don't let that happen. You have life in Christ. And baptism is like the wedding band that you put on to remind yourself of who you are in him. And every time we watch one, it reminds all of us of the wedding band that we have put on. And it is a witness to the world that we can have life in him and in him alone. 